Blacklantic Media acknowledges that it carries out its work on the traditional unceded territory of the Wallistaque, Mi'kmaq, and Peskotumakadi peoples. The- I would also like to acknowledge that I am seated on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We are here in Halifax for an in-person special episode today with none other than the prolific icon, former poet laureate of our country, George Elliott Clark. How are you doing today? I am doing great. Thank you so much for your interest in interviewing me. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, it's uh, we're quite excited to be here for an event that we have going on at the you have going on at the the Halifax Central Library in uh, in honor of uh, well Black History African Heritage Month uh, as well as the book that uh, has been released that you edited with Dr. Howard McCurdy. But uh, before I say too much, how about in your own words, let the the viewers know what's going on today. Well, I am so excited, so thrilled, so honored and privileged uh, to be able to be here in Halifax as primarily a guest of the Halifax Central Library, Halifax Public Libraries, uh, to do two things. One, which has already happened, which was uh, last Thursday night, uh, February 8th. And only a couple of days ago, but it's been a whirlwind uh, of a visit. And that was to uh, launch um, uh, autobiog- the autobiography of Howard Douglas McCurdy, Dr. Howard D. McCurdy. Uh, and the full title is Black Activist, Black Scientist, Black Icon. Uh, the Autobiography of Dr. Howard D. McCurdy, uh, who was many, many things. But the first couple of things I'll mention about him was um, he was the first Black tenured First Black Canadian tenured professor, 1959, University of Windsor. He was also the first Black department head of any uh, Canadian university, and that was, of course, the Department of Biology at the University of Windsor. Uh, He was also uh, the person who named the New Democratic Party uh, back in 1961. Uh, he was also a founder of the National Black Coalition of Canada, uh, a, an organization that lasted from 69 until the early 1980s. Uh, he was also a founder of the Canadian Association of University Teachers. So every single professor in Canada, every single one has a debt to Howard McCurdy, whether they know it or not. They do. So they should all be singing his praises every time a uh, contract comes up for renegotiation. <laughs> and for every penny that they receive in their salaries, they owe him a wow. great debt. Uh, so they, it's uh, every single one of them should run a note to buy a copy of this book. <laughs> they should, I agree. I, I, we <laughs> hurt you. <laughs> we, uh, I think Hillary told you we listened to the talk today yes. on the way here, and uh, I just didn't catch it. But So he was the first tenured Professor, not only the first black tenured professor, yes. the first one. In, that's amazing. Yeah. And uh, listening to the accolades being read out about yourself uh, yes. <laughs> this afternoon uh, took about five minutes. So I think, <laughs> I think we'll maybe do a, an edit cut to the video and uh, sure. properly introduce everything you've accomplished in your life as well. So much. That is uh, so kind of you to suggest. And sticking with Howard McCurdy, um, I worked for him on Parliament Hill for yes. four years, from 87 to 91. And and uh, I don't mind saying that uh, between the ages of 12 and 14, which is 1972 to 74, my beloved parents, both of them uh, deceased now, unfortunately, uh, went through a terrible divorce um, and breakup. I love them both very, very much. And to make a long story short, so during my teen years, I was basically bereft of my father. Uh, he was around and, and, you know, we got together from time to time, but he really wasn't essential part of my teen years because of the divorce. Um, and so when I went to work for Howard, Howard became a kind of father figure for me. I don't mind saying that. I'm almost 64. But I'm allowed to make those kinds of confessions. And, and he was a great father figure, a great role model, a great mentor, uh, because of the fact he had accomplished so much. Not only was he so accomplished and so well-spoken, so articulate, so clean, to quote what Joe Biden had to say about Barack Obama all those years ago, uh, and and so on, but also uh, fiercely independent in his thought, a committed socialist, social democrat, a believer in human rights and civil rights, uh, and also always impeccably dressed. 
Oh, that's yes. noted in this. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I don't take after him in that in that regard, but uh, certainly the fact also that he was PhD, a scientist, microbiologist, publisher of, of fifty different scientific uh, articles, and a world renowned expert in in mixobacteria. Yeah. And for anyone who's unsure what that means, it's bacteria that cause things to smell mm -hmm. and to stink. So he was an expert in all of that kind of actually very important bacteria because it helps break things down in the in the natural world, yes. uh, the decay process, mm -hmm. um, which is which is also a form of fertilization. Yeah. So so, but that was his area of expertise as a microbiologist, and it's also important to know in terms of in, in terms of creating germ free environments, bacteria free environments. So he was a, a very uh, a noted expert in those areas. Um, so I learned a lot working for him in those four years. I really respected him uh, tremendously. And so as he was becoming very sick and, um, you know, basically terminally ill uh, in the summer of 2017, he invited me to come to see him at his home in LaSalle, Ontario. So I went down to visit with him that summer. And and he was his usual ebullient, outrageous, fun self, doing a thousand things at the at the same time. Uh, and and uh, but he also asked me to edit his autobiography, mm -hmm. and that was an honor uh, for me. Uh, and I knew that he was entrusting me with a very serious project. And at the same time, I was hopeful that he had years left and that we would have a chance to work on the book together as we had worked on so many things together when I worked for him, 87 to 91. Yeah. Uh, but that was not to be. He passed away in February 2018 at the age of 85. Uh, good long life, uh, uh, many accomplishments and so on. Uh, but I will say for the record, I will admit it, uh, again, being willing to confess this thing, uh, these truths. I am not sure how happy, completely happy he would have been with the various liberties I took uh, in in telling his life story or helping him tell his life story. Uh, the biggest change I made was to, uh, he was a very formal writer, very formal. So he would always say father, mother, and I have him say mom and dad. I, so my I saw it as being my job to make the the autobiography more personable, more accessible for more readers, was just to make it more accessible, uh, more informal in tone, and also to try to inject as much wit and humor as possible uh, in subjects that might otherwise seem to some readers to be kind of dry. So I really wanted to try to enliven it without getting too far away from actual events and his actual personality. Right. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so I, I, as someone who has read, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there through the book. <laughs> I do want to say that I, I do think that that humor is, is definitely there and palpable. And I have laughed at moments where we discuss a lot, like, you know, racism or the term that I pointed out on the drive oh, that good. keeps getting used, yeah. negrophobia. <laughs> yeah, that's my, that's I was, my term. Yeah, I was, I knew you would like that um, semantics. Um, I thought it was very interesting that you, we have to try to find humor in these things that are atrocities and traumas that we face every single day, often in multiple moments of our lives, of our daily lives. And so that humor is something that I think will resonate for all Black readers because, we have to find humor in some things that are so hard in terms of, you know, the the negrophobia faces being a tenured lecturer in all of these institutions that he's founded. You have to find that to be able to keep going on. And so I appreciated that where I'm at in the book so far. <laughs> well, I just got to say a couple of things about this. First of all, <laughs> uh, negrophobia is a, a term invented by the great uh, sociologist, psychologist, uh, psychiatrist, uh, political scientist uh, who was Franz Fanon. Mm. Okay. Black skin, white masks. That's where he mm. comes up with the term. They wanted a term that he could use right alongside anti Semitism. Because he's also discussing anti Semitism and black skin, yeah. white masks. And, and so for him, negrophobia was the right way to, to, it was right, just the right term for that kind of discussion. Uh, and to come to the point about humor, Wow. I mean, 
you know, I, I think that uh, black cultures worldwide have gener- always generated great humorists, yep. great comics, great comedians, Absolutely. Uh, because of the fact that we have had to learn to be able to laugh. And and stand up comedians uh, and even spoken word poets and so on and poets in general other writers will have these great comic mo- moments and scenes to basically make fun of the people who try to persecute ourselves mm-hmm. who try to who try to make fun of us or who expect us to be minstrel figures mm-hmm. and and in turn in turn or rather uh, in opposition to that we make them figures of fun. We poke fun at them. We poke fun at the unreality, the surrealism, uh, and the ridiculousness of, of their racism, their homophobia, sexism, uh, anti-Semitism, and all the other destructive isms um, of this world. And, and, um, uh, and so Howard uh, did that in his own writing. Uh, and, but I tried to accent it just a little bit uh, in terms of my editing. Of, of the work as well. And I can tell you that in his private moments when he could kick back with some scotch and, of course, the ever-present cigarette. I know I shouldn't talk about these sins of flesh and vices. <laughs> it, was a, it was a different day, right? It, it was time. the smoky back room of politics. And, you know, that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? No, no. He could he could tell some jokes. He could have a, he could have a lot of fun. Uh, and, and again, be poking fun at people behind their backs and quite rightly so. Who had done ridiculous things. I mean, he talks about it in, in, in the autobiography at one point when he's elected to the House of Commons. Uh, a lot of his fellow, uh, new Democrats and sister new Democrats wanted to call him Dr. Detroit because he was from Windsor and right next door to Detroit, right? But there was also, he saw it, he understood it as also being a kind of racializing thing. I wouldn't say so. You're yes. the only black member of parliament in, the, in, you're the only black member of parliament, the only black new Democrat in parliament, and you're from Windsor, Ontario. So we're going to associate you with African America. Mm-hmm. We're going to call you Dr. Detroit. We're going to wipe out the fact that you're actually from one of the most fervently patriotic pro-Canada parts of Canada, which is Windsor, Essex County. Because folks live so close to Detroit, live so close to the United States, because they get so much American culture um, mm-hmm. coming across the border, yeah. because they can see up close the ridiculousness of, of the American political scene. Uh, Windsorites and people of, Win- of Essex County tend to be very fanatically Canadian, uh, much to the surprise of, of folks who don't get much outside Toronto, right, or maybe other parts of Canada. But southwestern Ontario is very fervently patriotic. That was uh, one part of the country that voted heavily against the free trade agreement back in 1988. So for Howard, to get to the point, to be called Dr. Detroit, a slap in the face. After all, he was also, he liked to tell everybody, I am the best educated member of Parliament. Nice. Not only am I that in the black member of Parliament, I am the best <laughs> educated. I am the PhD here. I am the guy who's got a BA, who's got who's got a BSC, who's got a an MSC, who's got a PhD. You know, you know, nobody in this nobody in this house. Absolutely not. Nobody else in this house can dare to go toe-to-toe to me when it comes to any kind of question of IQ, any kind of question of political smarts, even. Also, classic example of having to work three times as hard yes. to get to the same... Uh, usually, it's two times, but in this case, probably three times as hard to get to the same place as uh, other people. And I mean, not even to call him Dr. Wins or Dr. Detroit, where, you know, very big socioeconomic problems in that city, and also, like, call me by my name. That is yeah. insanely shocking. Um, I actually think it was great that you expressed that sentiment regarding uh, viewing, viewing him as a, a father figure, especially because in the book, it, it mentions how... Uh, his own father didn't tell him he loved him in, in until 58 and how much that meant to him. Mm-hmm. So I see that as a big term of endearment and uh, happy to hear you say that. Also, I think you're very humble in the talking about style because I've already complimented you on your, your purple shirt. And those, and, those, and those those glasses yes. are on point. Yes. Well, uh, you know what? Uh, once, I hit my, once I hit my late 50s, I started to think, I don't need to wear ordinary glasses anymore. No. So I'm gonna I'm gonna advertise Chinatown Optical in Toronto. Okay. China, Mr. Tai. Yep. Mr. Tai <laughs> will set you up. Nice. Mr. Tai, a Chinatown Optical will set you up. You know, he'll bring out he'll bring out those glasses that will have everybody looking 
at you as you are looking at them. They're looking at you, right? So I don't mind um, advertising Mr. Ty and and uh, uh, and his great array of spectacles, which are spectacles all unto themselves. It's having the desired effect. <laughs> wow. Um, I hope this question isn't isn't pers- too personal, but uh, was it hard editing the work of someone who you respected so deeply and then lost? Oh my golly, that's a great question, and and I will say that I went, I edited and edited and edited and edited. I, I think I went over the the manuscript um, at least seven times, and there's a lot of stuff that we had to cut out. It's still a very long book, not long in a boring way, but <laughs> long in in the sense that we have it's comprehensive. We we've, <laughs> we've got. The life story here, yeah, it's been delivered in this in this text. Never, uh, but still, it's true that we that there were things that we had to leave out just because. Um, but I'm very happy what we were able to maintain. But to answer the question directly, um, there were things about Howard I did not know until I until I went over the autobiography, and and uh, and many poignant episodes, such as the one when he's 58 years old before he hears his father tell him, "I love you." And I'm proud of you. And his father's dying when he says that, right? And then Howard has to go back to Ottawa immediately after uh, his father's funeral and deal with these fools. I'm going to call them that. These fools who are trying to accuse him of of having uh, been being, uh, being behind a prank pulled by the Canadian Federation of Students when they threw a, a whole lot of macaroni um, uh, cold macaroni out of the box, out of the box on on members of parliament, and Howard got accused uh, for having been behind that prank, you know, because of the fact that his office, our office, had issued some of the parliamentary passes for people. Mm. But as Howard pointed out, every MP hands out these parliamentary passes to guests who want to sit and watch question period. And we don't know, or, or it was impossible for him to know. It was impossible for us to know. I was still a staff member at the time. Uh, what these, these uh, ungrateful uh, but protesting citizens of Canada were going to do in, in terms of unleashing a hurricane of macaroni. Mm-hmm. And it was funny. On the other hand, if you're a member of parliament and you're wearing a toupee, <laughs> just, just to say it and you got a little toupee on it so all of a sudden you got the macaroni mixed up if you hear it you might have some questions about that but in any event um he could you know a couple of, of conservative backbench i'm going to call them backwater members of parliament tried to get on um howard's case about this and and actually, even uh, Howard believes, and and he says so in the article that he was concerned that even the Speaker of the House um, wanted to try to believe or suggest that Howard uh, was behind it, um, and and uh, it was proven that Howard was not, and and then of course he turned around and asked for a vote of on contempt. Yeah. Uh, for uh, the abuse of parliament that had been carried out by one of these conservative backwater, backbench, backward members of parliament. I don't mind calling all that kind of back stuff uh, because of the fact that um, they're no longer members of parliament, so it doesn't matter. And I didn't name, I didn't name most of them, but anybody who wants to know who I'm talking about, just pick up the autobiography and you can, and you can chime in and say, yes, I agree. <laughs> This guy was completely backward. Yeah, he was so backward when he was walking straight. He was backing into things. <laughs> anyway, the yeah. point of that whole anecdote, I'm sorry, taking so much time with just that one incident. Was you know the point of the thing about Howard hearing these profound words from his dad, mm-hmm. uh, being there for his, for his dad's funeral, and then having to come back to Ottawa to face th- this kind of ridiculous stuff. Um, you know, so yes, he could, he could, he could kick back and he could laugh, but he was also someone who could be fiercely and properly and righteously angry. There's another member of parliament. I won't, I won't name him here, but he's, he's certainly named in the text, uh, where Howard felt that, uh, he came close to a fist fight mm. with this other member of parliament who he felt was, uh, horning in a little too much on, on precious territory for Howard, which had to do with um, black community history, which had to do with uh, 
uh, the legacy of black presence in southern Ontario as a result of the Underground Railroad. And he felt this other MP was was basically stepping into uh, a talking point uh, that was not his place uh, to enter into. Uh, and there are a couple of moments which I do spell out in the, or I, I shouldn't put it that I spell it out, but but because Howard was so formal, he wouldn't say sometimes that I punch somebody. So I just like, I let him sort of like say that I punch somebody. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, for anybody listening, I, I mean, you should be watching to see George in the snazzy purple, but here is the cover. Black activist, black scientist, black icon, the autobiography of Dr. Howard D. McCurdy. Um, I wanted to point out a few things that I noticed. Um, I noticed the similarity in your description of the various tones and arrays of melanin from your, your autobiography or your, your memoir where beauty survived an Africadian memoir. Um, you discussed the rich colors and, and so so did he. And I thought that that was so fascinating because he's written this, you've edited it. And yet of, I would assume maybe from your work together, like this similarity really struck, like struck a chord with me that you both described this. And it was also very curious um, because obviously growing up in Nova Scotia and I've done a little bit of research about how um, Maine and the, the prevalence of the KKK in Maine actually impacted the KKK in New Brunswick. And I don't really know about Nova Scotia, but seeing this border comparison between Windsor and Detroit, I was curious about the similarities in your life and also what you noticed in terms of similarities of writing style, because I know that you claim in the book and also in the talk on Thursday that you were surprised at how well that this was immediately written. So I'm curious about that. Oh, those are great questions, Hillary. Uh, fantastic questions. And and when I worked for Howard, my job was uh, essentially to answer letters from constituents and also make sure that press releases got sent out, particularly to the Windsor Star and the Windsor CBC and so on, so that he was there always in the news and being seen to be working on behalf of his constituents because he wanted to be reelected. And I was desperate to see him reelected because I wanted to keep my job because I knew <laughs> That if Howard was defeated and he lost his job, it was very unlikely that any other, even that any other NDP member of Parliament was going to say, "Hey, uh, Clark, yeah, I, I want you to come and work for me." Um, that would have been very unlikely, and and I did not want to come back to Halifax and and walk the mean streets of Halifax with my beat up, bad looking briefcase <laughs> with a lot of empty papers in it, right? Trying to trying to get somebody to give me a job. Uh, so I was desperate to see how it reelected. So one of the things that that uh, uh, so I was really keen to make sure the letters that got sent out to constituents on behalf on Howard's behalf, he would always read them. He would sign them. Uh, there were times when he would say, "No, I, you know, you've got to change the phrasing here. You've got to change a sentence over there," uh, because uh, he would find that my tone was too aggressive or mm. or 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 maybe too flippant and and so on. So he would he would haul me in or pull me back on some things, uh, but you know, for the most part, ninety uh, percent of the stuff I wrote, he approved. And, and signed off on and, and trusted me very much so, uh, to get things right in, in that literary sense. And we actually did publish an article together that I'm very proud of. And that was, uh, published in Policy Options Magazine, 1993. And it was about the need to get rid of the notwithstanding clause in the, in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And, 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 or, or I suppose I should say, or, uh, suspend the application of the notwithstanding clause to minority communities. And for anyone who's been following the issues of particularly Western provinces like Alberta, uh, trying to deprive trans Canadians of their rights yes. and using the notwithstanding clause to basically, for those who are unfamiliar with the notwithstanding clause, the section 33 of the constitution, uh, which Pierre Trudeau agreed to include in order to satisfy the conservatives who were opposed to the idea that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms should be embedded in the Constitution. Uh, so the, the point of the notwithstanding clause is that any government can use it to suppress rights of any community, any community, except women, because the only, the only equality that's actually protected in the Constitution is gender equality. That's the only one that is. Wow. All the other potential prejudicial moves that a, that any Canadian government, provincial or federal, can make against any community of Canadians, they're all of them are unprotected. 
And, so we, can, and we can see that being used right now by the government of Alberta yes. to oppress transgender Canadians. Correct. Right? Because they can pass legislation saying we're going to uh, prevent transgender Canadians of having uh, these particular rights. Yes. And then they can say, and we're invoking the notwithstanding clause, which means that no court, not even the Supreme Court of Canada, can strike down right. that prejudicial, uh, 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 homophobic, uh, sexist, uh, uh, fascistic, I, I, I don't want to use the F word, the F bomb, fascistic <laughs> yeah. legislation. No, no court can strike it down for five years. The notwithstanding clause protects uncivil uncivil fascistic applications of legislation by any Canadian government for five years. And even when the five year limit is up, they can reimpose the legislation. They have to they have to pass it through the legislature again, but they can reassert it for another five years. I was not aware of that at all. I, I read the Emergency Measures Act during COVID, and I read about how provinces and governments can rescind our rights during an Emergency Measures Act, but I did not know that that was written into the actual charter. Or, or, yeah. Wow. Yeah. It was, it was, no, just... I wasn't, it was, it was horrible. <laughs> and so, it's, and it's so, so, so 21 horrible. years ago, you wrote an article with Dr. Howard D. McCurdy talking about how wrong this is, and it is yeah. still relevant yeah. this many years later. Uh, Howard, in his last years as a member of parliament, he was adamant that this mm -hmm. had to change. That this, he really? just, as he said in many speeches, my rights not up for negotiation with any Canadian government. But you know, even the NDP, which he was a member of, was was not willing mm -hmm. to come out and take that position, to support that position uh, vigorously or un un unwilling, right? Because they just saw it as, oh, it's black people. I'm going to guess that's what they were thinking. Oh, it's just black Canadians are, could be upset by this. It could be, that, oh, well, what, you know, why should we? Or indigenous Canadians could be upset. But so we're not going to really take it seriously or worry about it too much. Like, you know, their, their rights are actually, yeah, we can, you know, it's okay if they get oppressed, um, for five years or whatever. Uh, but so long as gender equality is protected in the, in the constitution, why should we have to worry about anything else? Um, and, and, uh, so, so that's why he was so adamant about it and tried very, very hard within the NDP and, and as a member of parliament. Uh, and ultimately to write that article for policy options, uh, to, and he describes it, we described it as being a demolition clause in the Constitution. And it is still very relevant. So for any lawyer, any law student who's listening to this podcast, time for you to, to start up a class action suit. Time for you to start up yeah. a class action suit on a whole bunch of, of issues. I guess a whole bunch of Canadian so, governments, provincial and federal. That's right. And, and, and get some money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's we, we write that starting in the Constitution. Yeah, get some, get some money. <laughs> you go ahead. Oh, I was uh, just going to say, I asked the last question, and okay. I also would like to ask this when we're cheating. Okay. Well, we're also <laughs> keeping our eye on the clock of here. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Full of your time. We can go for a few more minutes. Okay, okay perfect. Okay. What, if not that, and maybe that is it, what do you think is the most important legacy of uh, Dr. McCurdy's uh, life, uh, especially for young Black Canadians today? Uh, you know what? I, I finally got it after I'd been through the the uh, autobiography many, many times. And finally, I was, I was trying to think as I was editing, like, what is the message here? What is mm -hmm. the life lesson? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it boils down to recognizing our talents as being our powers. And we often don't think about it that way. You know, we're often told, like, you know, use your talent and maximize your talents and make a living at what you're good at and, and so on. But there's another dimension that Howard recognized and applied it in his own life uh, in every single in field of endeavor that that, that he attempted. Uh, and that is to recognize that your talent is not just a means to make a living. It's not just a means to earn attention. Uh, for for your gifts, it's actually it's a, actually a form of power. It's actually your your individual power, or if you have more than one talent, you have powers plural. And so, for, uh, just for sake of argument, uh, when I can just speak about about Howard, uh, he was a great orator, he's a great speaker. So 
you know, that's important in Parliament. It's, it was important for him in Windsor City Council as a, as a Windsor City Councilor. But it was also important for him uh, struggling uh, to end segregation in southwestern Ontario. It was an important means for him to be able to organize people uh, and to form uh, groups like the Guardian Club in the 1960s to fight against segregation and racism, anti-Black racism in Windsor and Essex County. Uh, it was also important for him as a, as a way to to um, uh, run his his uh, uh, very successful, at least in at least in the effort itself, very successful effort to become the leader of the New Democratic Party in 1989. And even though he finished fifth on the first ballot, that was not because of the fact that the campaign itself was not an excellent campaign. It was. Uh, his problem, which is which is mentioned in the autobiography, is that uh, 200 uh, Saskatchewan delegates that were supposed to vote for him uh, changed their minds at the last minute. And he was told by another Saskatchewan uh, member of parliament that it was because he was black. Mm. That these NDP members who are supposed to vote for him were told Canadians will never accept a black prime minister. So therefore, you can't not you cannot vote for Howard McCurdy. But somebody forgot that the NDP was not in a position of power. Howard was not going to become prime minister of Canada right. by winning the NDP leadership race. Right. So it was just simply a completely right. hostile, racist action. And it explains one reason why Howard had to end up calling the New Democratic Party the Negro Disappointment Party. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Yeah, because by the end he became a liberal. Yes. At the end, at the end, uh, because of the fact that the party turned on him so ferociously, including the uh, the members of Ontario, uh, Windsor, Essex County, after he had been a two term member of Parliament, after he had done so much, uh, they they turned vehemently against him, and in the last nomination party nomination battle that he participated in for a by-election in Windsor Essex County in 1997. His daughters were present, his adult daughters were present, and they told him that the N-word was used. The N-word was used in that in that final nomination uh, uh, battle for a uh, potential by-election um, no, for a by-election uh, that he was trying to contest. And when he heard that, when he lost, and when he knew that uh, negrophobic mm -hmm. voting was part of the reason for his loss, he says in the autobiography, this is also very poignant, I went home, I watched Tiger Woods win his first uh, uh, master's title, mm. and that was the last day in which I was a member of the NDP. Wow. All right, and and then it was like, okay, I'm a liberal now, All right? And and uh, there were others who made the same kind of move, and you know, we're speaking in early 2024, but when I look at how the Ontario NDP treated uh, a member of their caucus, a member of the Ontario Legislature, an elected member of the Ontario Legislature, Ms. Jama, by by throwing her out of the caucus, yes, and 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 then. And then allowing the uh, Ontario government to deny her a right to speak as an elected representative. Yep. This was anti-democratic. Yes. And I wonder if the same treatment would have been meted out to anybody who was not black. So it's 2024. And we have to be aware that even in the highest echelons of Canadian democracy, undemocratic, anti-democratic behavior can take place, especially when the person who is at the butt of the, uh, re the recipient of this kind of, of, of uh, I'll say, small f fascistic behavior. Mm -hmm. I'll put a small f out there so nobody gets really upset. Small f fascistic behavior. It's not capital F, it's a small f. Um, so don't anybody get mad. Uh, but I'm going to call it that. Or get mad. Yeah, or get, or get mad the and truth, you know, the truth. take it up yeah. with the Ontario government. Yeah. Take yeah, it up absolutely. with them. Don't take it up with me. Yes. I'm a private citizen exercising yes, my right that's... to freedom of speech. Absolutely. So you take it up with the Ontario government, ask them to explain how they can be so anti-democratic yep. and try to get away with it. It's appalling. But, I have, you know, we've got to be positive. <laughs>
<laughs> We've got to be positive. So we'll be positive. Absolutely. Um, I'll ask very quickly because I'm noticing the time. Um, why do you think autobiographies like Dr. Howard D. McCurdy's and also your memoir, Where Beauty Survived, are so important to the Canadian landscape and to Black Canadians? Because we need to know our history. You know, it's a bottom line, fundamental thing. We need to know our history. Because so long as people, all Canadians, everybody, is not aware of the history of Indigenous people, the treaties, mm -hmm. uh, the fact that Indigenous people have a special relationship to the crown, uh, the very fact that we have the crown, the, the very fact that we're a monarchy, uh, the very uh, fact that we're a hierarchically organized society under the British North America Act, uh, and even continuing on into the post-charter constitution of 1982 and 1987. Um, this is a country that was set up on a basis of colonialist and imperialist uh, practices and tendencies, which included allowance of slavery uh, until its final extirpation in 1834, thanks to the British Empire. Uh, the fact that, that we had slavery also made it possible uh, for the persistence of anti-Black negrophobic racism, mm -hmm. uh, which we continue to deal with. Uh, and, and, uh, and all the ramifications of that, the fact that the people of Canada and city dwellers continue to be under the thumb of their police forces, as opposed to being able to control the police, which should be the number one thing in any democracy. In any democracy, the police must be under powerful civilian control. So the, the civilian control of police should be so, should be so tight, so nasty, so powerful that the police are saying, you can't breathe. You can't breathe. Yeah. We, the police should not be allowed to breathe. The police, the stranglehold of civilian control of police should be so restrictive that the police are complaining, we can't breathe. Not George Floyd, but mm. police should be saying we can't breathe. The fact that, that citizens can be put in a position where they can't breathe should never be allowed. Should never be allowed. It should always be that the police can't breathe. And that the police are saying, are crying, gasping for breath. I need me help. Can I use my taser? No, you can't. Can I use my? No, you can't. Can I have a pension? Price? No, you can't. And the police union should be destroyed. Police unions should be eliminated because they have too much power in our society. Anti-democratic power. We've got police unions right now in Toronto trying to bully the Toronto City Council into increasing the police budget. It was already increased by $48 million. Yes, it was. $48 million in 2023. And they're back this year saying we need another $21 million. And the city is saying, well, we can afford to pay you $7 million. Keep in mind, we've got a uh, $1.8 billion deficit because Queen's Park is, is sitting on tens of billions of dollars that they're not willing to give to the number one economic engine in terms of urban Canada. Yeah. Right? And, and and so then you've got the police trying to muscle uh, uh, the city council led by a mayor who has a social democratic pedigree, right? And, and so this should not be permitted in a truly democratic society. It should not be, it should not be permitted. That's, wow, that's so powerful. That's so prolific. I've never heard it said like that before. No, Thank you. Not. Yeah. You're getting, you're getting ready disagree. for what you're doing downstairs yeah, yeah, shortly. Yeah, yeah, I disagree, and we have to wrap this yeah, up. Yeah, for you, talk. so that we can come downstairs and yes. we'll go watch the event. May I just say one Thank thing you. about the event that's coming up? And yes, it is, absolutely. It is, it is yeah, right, yeah. right away for it, but uh, very quickly, um, because of the pandemic back in December 2020, I wanted to give my companion a, a wonderful Christmas gift, so I reached yeah. out to composer James Rolfe, uh, to write some music for a poem by her. Her name is Giovanna Riccio, and the poem is Namesake. And so we surprised her on Christmas Day with my cousin Sheila White uh, singing uh, her poem, now a song, back to her with piano accompaniment. And and uh, so she loved it. James loved doing the the, the commission. Uh, and and so I said, okay, let's let's get a few more songs uh, done. And and then a few more became a dozen plus. And and so ultimately, uh, last October, twenty twenty three, James Rolfe released his great CD, Wound Turned to light. And of the 16 tracks on that wonderful CD, Wound Turned to Light by James Rolfe, R-O-L-F-E, 16 of the songs are my commissions, including a piece 
uh, by a certain Leonard Cohen. I know nobody's ever heard of him. Hey, that's, that's true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. True. <laughs> Leonard Cohen's poem for EJP. Because he was a poet before he, before yes. he became you know, a real famous, colossally, universally adulated uh, singer-songwriter. Yeah. But he was a poet first. And so uh, for EJP, we wrote the music for James Rolfe wrote the music for it. And it's now a song on that on that CD. But James Rolfe, uh, uh, working with him, got me working with Dee Dee Jackson. Uh, and so Dee Dee's going to debut seven new songs today here at the Halifax Central Library, uh, beginning at 2 o'clock in a few minutes. Uh, and and these are songs uh, from poems uh, by all Africadian, African Nova Scotian, Scotian, Black Nova Scotian uh, uh, writers. Uh, uh, folks can use whatever kind of nomenclature they choose to use. Uh, this comes back. I'll suddenly remember. I didn't answer the question about all the array of skin colors and so on that Howard talks about and I talk about. But it's just to represent the fact that, and I'm uh, coming back to the poets for today. We have a spectrum. Mm-hmm. Of 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 talents and a spectrum of ideas and faiths and so on in the African Canadian polity, uh, and at the same time we are because of imperialism, slavery, uh, uh, enslavement, uh, colonialism, and also because of a certain thing called L O V E. From time to time, uh, we have over generations uh, intermixed, intermarried, uh, had children with and by and through uh, uh, folks from many different backgrounds. And so we have have ended up with a truly rainbow coalition of shades and 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 skin colors. And I think it's absolutely beautiful that we run the gamut from ivory to indigo, uh, mahogany, ebony, burnt sienna, uh, uh, it, it, it just so umber, uh, some gold and copper and, and brass and bronze and so on. I think it's just like what a beautiful gift to humanity that we have this array of 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 colors uh, that can all be brought under the umbrella of black, the prism of black, and, and and so. But along with that, there's also the intellectual side of things and and of talent being equal to power and our talents being equal to power just to sum all this up and so the great brilliant uh jazz maestro juno award winning emmy award winning d d jackson robert d d jackson in the house from manhattan from nyc from Ooh. appearing with the who's who of the what what uh is here in halifax uh, to tickle the ivories uh, and and the ebony's uh, for that matter, uh, uh, with uh, the support of the tremendous vocalist uh, Linda Carvery to bring to the ears and the tapping feet of so many Haligonians, lucky, blessed Haligonians this afternoon, uh, his renditions, his music, his songs, uh, made out of seven uh, poems commissioned by yours truly and the Halifax Public Libraries. Amen. And we're going to let you go so that we can also go enjoy it. Thank you but so I, much. I think you're all warmed up. Yeah. <laughs> so Thank you. Thank you very quickly to, uh, to Nimbus Thanks. Publishing for the book, to yeah. George Elliott, Clark, so many accolades. We're going to let you get downstairs. Everybody, go get a copy and check back on our socials because we will be posting about what's going on downstairs. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.